Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. I'll tell you more about them in a bit. Shangri-La first appeared in a novel as the name of a hidden utopia. Deep in the Malayas, far from the paths of common men, it was a lamasery, populated by Buddhist monks and lay individuals seemingly immune to the process of aging and sheltered from the foibles of daily life. It was discovered by the English survivors of a plane wreck after they had struggled for days against a mountain blizzard. Escapist fiction, including Lost Horizon, where Shangri-La first appeared, found an appreciative audience during the dark days of the Great Depression. A film version starring Ronald Coleman, then at the height of his Hollywood fame, was equally successful. The public found the escapist fantasy of Shangri-La irresistible, and the name of the hidden lamasery became synonymous with Eden, Utopia, and other versions of Paradise on Earth. In both Britain and America, Shangri-La took on a mythical status. It became a real place, somewhere in the mysterious mountains of Asia, hidden from the most intrepid explorers. The Complications of modern life worsened by the continuing plague of the Great Depression created a yearning for the simplicity of life experienced there. Shangri-La, a fictional idea, created a desire for a real place in the public mind, one which has been sought ever since. Over the years, it has been several real places, none of them is described by their creator, British writer James Hilton. Explorers and historians have proposed several potential sites, and others have been designated Shangri-La for various reasons. Here is the fictional Shangri-La, as created in the imagination of James Hilton and some others, which have borne the name courtesy of the imagination of others. James Hilton worked as a writer for the Manchester Guardian in Britain after completing his education at Christ's College, Cambridge. In his spare time, he worked on a novel, a practice he had begun while in school. He published his first novel in 1920 while still a student. It was not a success. Literary accomplishment continued to elude him until 1931, when he published the novel And Now Goodbye. It was the first of a series of novels which brought him international acclaim as a writer along with financial success. Hilton was fascinated with stories of European explorers and travelers in the mountains of Tibet, among them articles written by Joseph of Rock for the National Geographic Society. Hilton borrowed liberally from the accounts written by Rock, including the existence of isolated lamasseries as well as those of other explorers of the remote regions. He later claimed to have taken the name Shangri-La from the ancient Tibetan texts found in the British Museum, a name which he said described one such hidden lamasery. Hilton later referred to the town of Junction City, California, as the inspiration for the fictional Shangri-La, or at least its physical location and topographical appearance. Others have since suggested Weaverville, California, as the site which inspired the English author. Was Shangri-La inspired by a California town? Well, possibly. Hilton had no direct knowledge of the Tibetan mountains, and he once referred to Weaverville as reminding him of Shangri-La. While he wrote the novel, he resided in London, where he had access to the collections of the British Museum, not California, which was a future home. You know what they say, if you can't build it yourself, let Squarespace do it for you. With Squarespace, you can stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, even your time. So let's talk about some of the amazing features that Squarespace offers. First up, for all you creators and educators out there, there's Squarespace's member areas, which make it easy to monetize your content and expertise. You can sell access to gated content like classes, online courses, or even newsletters, which can unlock a new revenue stream for your business. And for those of you looking to build your email list, Squarespace's email campaigns are a game changer. You can collect email subscribers and then convert them into loyal customers using customizable email templates that reflect your brand. And let's not forget collect donations. Whether you're supporting a cause or running a charity, Squarespace make it easy to gather contributions with PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe, and Venmo. Plus, with Squarespace's powerful analytics tools, you can gain powerful insights into who's visiting your site and how they're interacting with your content. Plus, for all you bloggers out there, it's very easy to share your stories, photos, videos, and updates on all your socials. So, head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain using the code geographics. And now back to today's video. Hilton based his story on information he collected while in Britain, rather than on first-hand observations in the mountains of Tibet. He relied on reported myths and legends to which he had access, the journals of travelers and explorers, and his own fertile imagination to create the story he related in Lost Horizon, depicting a peaceful world surrounded and hidden by one hostile, both from its climate and its inhabitants. Scholars dispute whether a reference to a place called Shangri-La existed in the British Museum or anywhere else before Hilton selected the name. 
1933, Jane Silton published the novel Lost Horizon. The novel tells the tale of a British writer and diplomat in China, then in considerable turmoil due to Japanese aggression and internal revolt. A group of British citizens flee to China, hoping to fly over the mountains to India and eventually home. Their aircraft gets lost in snowy weather over the mountains, runs out of fuel, and eventually crashes. Lost, weakened by the effects of the crash and snow blind from the blizzard, they are forced to struggle through, then they're rescued by porters. They're then taken to a pristine, warm, and peaceful valley dominated by a lamasery called Shangri-La. One of the Englishmen, Hugh Conway, is determined to leave the valley and reach home. Others of his party demure, with one learning her previously terminal illness had apparently been cured. They learn that other Westerners in the valley have been there for decades without visibly aging. They also learn that the High Lama, who leads the Lamasery, is actually a formerly Catholic priest over two centuries old, and aware that the end of his life is near, the High Lama had arranged for their flight to be hijacked, having determined through a perusal of Conway's writings that he would serve as a suitable replacement for the office of High Lama. The valley is completely surrounded by treacherous mountain paths, and it's subject to avalanches and severe weather. Yet, inside the confines of the valley, the weather is benign, the food plentiful and nutritious, and labor unnecessary except as recreation. Most of the Westerners grow to enjoy their existence with its lack of worry, illness, and fear of aging. As time goes on, they learn the occupants of Shangri-La did age, though slowly and without visible effects. Conway, meanwhile, grows to realize he's a prisoner held against his will and is determined to escape the utopian setting and complete his duty. The novel was a rousing success, Hilton's best-selling work to date, and it continued to sell for several years. It eventually became the first novel to be published in paperback form. The exact whereabouts of the Shangri-La of the novel were deliberately vague. That such a pleasant haven could exist within the harsh environment of the Tibetan mountains caught the public's fancy, as did the exotic nature of the Lamasery and its contrast with events then unfolding in China. Hollywood took note. In late 1935, film director Frank Capra began a work on the film version of Hilton's novel, also to be called Lost Horizon. Lost Horizon was an early version of what would be called in later days a Hollywood blockbuster. It starred Ronald Coleman, then one of the most popular leading men in both British and American film. Jane Wyatt co-starred alongside Thomas Mitchell and Edward Everett Horton, all major stars of the 1930s. But the real stars of the film were the sets representing Shangri-La and the harsh, unwelcoming terrain which surrounded the valley. Set pieces representing Shangri-La were built in Palm Springs in California's Lucerne Valley. The Sierra Nevada Mountains provided towering peaks as backdrops. Blizzards were created on sound stages as were scenes of the actors struggling through them. Black and white travelogue footage from the Himalayas were incorporated within the film. Capra followed the novel's extensive dialogue while also providing substantial scenes of the conditions in the mountains and in Shangri-La, leading to high cost overruns and an overall lengthy film. Capra's first cut ran to over six hours, his second more than three, and after previews, which were poorly received by audiences, it was reduced to just over two hours. Released in 1937, it failed to repay the significant investment of the studio. In 1942, it received some unexpected publicity from the President of the United States, as will be seen, and it was released again, finally achieving a profit that year. The film version garnered several Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, which it failed to win. In 1952, the film was released again and trimmed down to just over 90 minutes. The 1952 release was edited to remove appearances in the Lamasery that appeared to reflect favorably on communism deemed necessary following the takeover of China by Mao and his followers. It has also been remade or otherwise adapted to other media, including a 78 RPM record album narrated by Ronald Coleman, an off-Broadway musical made into a film in 1973, and as a radio play on live. Radio Theatre in 1948. None achieved the success of the original Capra epic, or for that matter, the Hilton novel, which became a bestseller again as a paperback in the 1950s. In April 1942, American morale and faith in its military was at its lowest. The powerful Pacific Fleet had been shattered at Pearl Harbor. Guam had fallen to the Japanese, as had Wake Island. American forces in the Philippines had been forced back, surrender was imminent, and MacArthur, their commander, had fled to Australia. In the Atlantic, German submarines operated within eyesight of the coast, wreaking havoc on shipping. Americans, unused to and already weary of defeat, had little to console them. Then, early that spring, the President announced stunning news. United States Army Air Force planes had bombed Tokyo. Less than five Five months after the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, American fighting forces had claimed vengeance, striking at the heart of the Japanese Empire within shouting distance of the home of the Emperor himself. Militarily speaking, the raid was insignificant. There was little damage to Japanese infrastructure and few casualties. The raiders themselves, the famed Doolittle Raiders, flew on to China and, in most cases, captivity, though a few made it back to American bases. Their commander, James Doolittle, made it home and became a national hero, deservedly lauded for the achievement accomplished by his men. The Doolittle Raid, as it became known to history, is a near legend 
legendary tale of American tenacity in the face of impossible odds. That dark April, President Franklin Roosevelt used the heroism of his army pilots to bolster the flagging morale of the American public. A Roosevelt press conference consisted of a reporters and columnists standing in a semicircle around FDR's desk while the president made his remarks and answered questions assisted by his press secretary, Steve Early. In announcing the Doolittle raid on Tokyo, FDR was clearly jubilant. Most aspects of the raid were classified secret, details uh, which FDR could not share with the press. The army bombers had been ferried to a launch point by a US Navy task force, which was still at sea when the raid was revealed to the public. Naturally, the reporters surrounding the president's desk were curious as to from whence the American airplanes came. FDR oh, was unhesitant in addressing the reporters' questions. They came, he intoned, from our secret base in Shangri-La. Newspapers and radio broadcasters dutifully reported the president's remarks, and across the country the existence of an American air base hidden in the Himalayan mountains became the subject of discussion, no doubt bolstered by the fact of the air crews returning to China following the raid. How many Americans took the president at his word is impossible to estimate, but Shangri-La took on a new meaning in the United States, with the perception among some that it represented a real place, mysterious and murky. It would not be the last time FDR would use the name to designate an American facility. During his first two terms as president, FDR enjoyed the use of the presidential yacht when seeking to temporarily escape the travails of office. Operated by the U.S. Navy as commissioned vessels, the president had, at different times, the use of yachts Williamsburg, Potomac, and Sequoia at his disposal. FDR used the yachts for entertaining, for business, and for fishing trips, sailing along the Potomac River, Chesapeake Bay, and the Atlantic seaboard. America's entry into World War II generated concern among the officers of the U.S. Navy that the president's security at sea was at best risky. Rather than resorting to the yacht for rest and recreation, the Navy recommended the president make use of the rural camp established by his predecessor, Herbert Hoover, in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Camp Rapidan, as it was known, had been expanded for Hoover's use in the 1920s at his personal expense. He gave it to the government when he left office. It offered a relaxed setting, excellent trout fishing, and relatively rapid communication with Washington, D.C. FDR enjoyed trout fishing, and the idea of the camp appealed to him, but an early visit to the facility was discouraging. The camp's footpaths were too narrow to accommodate the president's wheelchair. Many were too steep for him to comfortably traverse, and modifying the facility to allow him better access was deemed too expensive. Still, FDR liked the idea, and he instructed his aides to seek a more suitable facility to meet his needs. One was found near the small town of Thurman, Maryland, in the Katakin Mountains. In those days, the president did not fly by helicopter, preferring to travel on land by train or automobile. Thurman offered relatively good roads for the use of a presidential automobile. It offered a small campsite built by the Works Progress Administration, WPA, during the Depression. FDR visited, liked what he saw, and directed the U.S. Navy to transfer the crew of the presidential yacht as well as support personnel to the new camp. U.S. Marines worked to expand the camp and its cabins. The Navy designated the camp Naval Support Facility Thurmont. The president gave it another name. He called the facility Shangri-La. Throughout the remainder of his presidency, FDR enjoyed stays there. During one of Winston Churchill's visits to Washington over the course of the war, the two statesmen spent a weekend at the camp enjoying the trout fishing as well as the restful atmosphere. The camp was marked with a sign designating the facility as Shangri-La, its gates guarded by U.S. Marines and when the president was in residence by Secret Service agents. FDR's successor, Harry Truman, also resorted to Shangri-La, though he quickly established his preference for the so-called Little White House at Key West, Florida. It seems that Mrs. Truman did not enjoy Shangri-La. Eisenhower succeeded Truman and found the Thurmont facility less than an hour by car from his own farm near Gettysburg. He preferred the farm. He also did not like the name, which had been used by the facility since FDR christened it and accordingly had it changed. He named it for his grandson, David Eisenhower, and the facility has been known as Camp David ever since. Shangri-La traditionally conjures the image of a peaceful, idyllic existence. FDR was the first to connect the name to another image when he made his humorous reference to the secret base hidden in the mountains. The Doolittle Raid, to which the president referred, had actually been launched from the deck of the USS Hornet, one of just a handful of aircraft carriers then in commission in the US Navy. That ship was lost to combat in the early years of the war, but by late 1944, the US Navy had more than two dozen fleet carriers and several more light carriers. Among the former was an Essex-class aircraft carrier christened USS Shangri-La. Life in that iteration of Shangri-La was a far cry from an idyllic existence. Shangri-La carried propeller-driven aircraft, which featured powerful, piston-driven engines that operated without mufflers. During flight operations, the entire steel structure of the ship vibrated from the thundering of the engines of the Hellcat fighters, the Hell Diver dive bombers, and the Avenger torpedo planes. The ship's own machinery, its engines, evaporators, cranes, condensers, ordnance handling equipment, galleys, windlasses, and capstans, aircraft handling equipment, and myriad other machinery added to the din. The 
Korea War in the Pacific took place in largely tropical waters, and the aircraft carriers of the time were not equipped with air-conditioned spaces. In addition to the incessant noise, the crews endured tropical heat and humidity, often in situations where the availability of water was limited due to military necessity. As the war went on, U.S. carrier operations drew nearer and nearer to the home islands of Japan, as well as in and near the Aleutian Island chain. There, where the conditions were equally harsh, though ice and biting cold replaced the heat and humidity of the tropics. Life aboard the ship also presented dangers in the form of massive stores of munitions, bombs, torpedoes, machine gun ammunition for the ship's aircraft, shells, and additional ammunition for the ship's defensive guns. Highly inflammable aviation gasoline was carried in the ship's fuel bunkers, and carriers were often called upon to refuel their escort vessels while at sea, a difficult and dangerous duty, even under the best of conditions. In addition, the desire of the Japanese Navy to sink American ships meant life aboard Shangri-La, like aboard its fellow ships, was dangerous. Somehow, despite the dangers, life quickly became one of boring routine, with each day playing out more or less like the one before. Sailors awoke to read the plan of the day, swept and swabbed the decks, polished the bright work, and uh, went about their assigned duties as the carriers plied the Pacific waters, or sat in remote anchorages, or underwent maintenance at naval bases across the vast ocean. Shangri-La entered service in late 1944, christened by Mrs. Josephine Doolittle, wife of the leader of the Doolittle Raiders. In May of 1945, Vice Admiral John S. McCain hoisted his flag aboard Shangri-La as Commander Carrier Task Force 2. Shangri-La saw action at Okinawa, and during the summer of of 1945, its airplanes bombed targets in the Japanese home islands. Decommissioned and mothballed after the war, Shangri-La returned to service during the Korean War and again during the Vietnam War. The ship was finally decommissioned in 1971 and eventually broken up for scrap. The warship Shangri-La had never been remotely close to being a utopia. Its name, based upon FDR's taunting reference to the hidden Himalayan site, vanished from the US Navy's inventories with the ship's decommissioning, and Shangri-La returned to the realm of fiction and fantasy. In the late 20th century, and continuing to the present day, the government of the People's Republic of China supported Western tourism as a means of bolstering local economies. Included within the vast lands which comprised China are the remains of scores of ancient civilizations and cultures, among them those to be found in what is today the Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. Numerous ancient shrines, prayer wheels, temples, and lamasseries are located within the province. Some advertised their relationship to the lost Shangri-La to attract tourists. In the 21st century, the Chinese government took action to increase tourism tourism in the county of Zhongdiang, the government seat of the Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. To reinforce its connection with ancient Tibetan culture, at least in Western eyes, and to take advantage of its large collection of ancient Tibetan architecture there, some of it which is over a thousand years old, they renamed the county. It became the county of Shangri-La in December 2001. In 2014, it was upgraded to a city county, retaining its name. Though it was an attempt to increase tourism, the action hardly bestowed utopian status on the region. In January 2014, a fire struck the ancient Tibetan neighborhood of Shangri-La, destroying over 240 homes and businesses, though most of the ancient temples were undamaged. Other related sites geared toward the tourist industry and located outside the neighborhood were spared as well. As a result, most of the suffering caused by the fire was borne by local residents. The tourist industry suffered little damage. Today's real Shangri-La, unlike that encountered by Robert Conway, as Hugh Conway was known in the film version, and his compatriots, can be reached by bus, automobile, and air via Deking Shangri-La Airport. There is also a rail connection from Lijiang, about four hours from Shangri-La. No struggling through dramatic and treacherous mountain passes is required, nor do visitors to the real Shangri-La encounter the weather conditions described by Hilton in his novel and depicted in the 1937 film. Winters are described as mild and sunny, summers as cool and wet. Although weather conditions can and do disrupt traffic on occasion, nothing like the fury of the storms which appear in the fictional Shangri-La. Those who do visit can explore, in addition to the ancient temples and monasteries, the Padakwauk National Park, the three parallel rivers of Yunnan World Heritage Site, and the Tiger Leaping Gorge, all highly touted and popular tourist sites. Tourism has grown in the region, yet at least to date there have been no reported sightings of a hidden lamasery tucked away securely from the modern world where there is no hunger, no war, and people live free from disease and aging for more than two centuries. That site continues to remain in the imagination, a product of whimsy safe from the inevitable predations of reality.